Hey, Charlie, how you feeling? You doing okay? Yeah. Good, good, good. good afternoon, and Happy New Year to those of you I haven't seen since, since the new year. I um, wanted to just take an opportunity to catch people up on a variety of things. But one thing I wanted to acknowledge, which I think some of you may have captured while General Metz was briefing yesterday, but yesterday represented uh, a traditional day in Iraq known as our Army Day, January 6th. Uh, they've been, uh, has been the traditional Iraqi Army Day. Obviously, it predates the Saddam Hussein regime. I'm told that it uh, began 84 years ago with the birth of the Iraqi Army as it existed during that era, 1921. Uh, it, the Iraqis themselves celebrated it yesterday uh, with a parade and with uh, some announcements regarding some structure uh, and some reorganizational uh, merging into the, of the Iraqi army to give it a little bit better unit identity. It's something the Iraqis justifiably are quite proud of. The Iraqi prime minister spoke about it somewhat yesterday. Uh, I think we've got some facts, or maybe the uh, multinational corps uh, has some facts or a fact sheet that we can provide to you, but it's quite a momentous time. Uh, obviously, as the Iraqi elections draw near, Iraqi security forces are, in fact, uh, shouldering a greater share of responsibility for security in Iraq. Uh, General Metz, General Corelli, and the others who have briefed you recently have talked some, something about that. Uh, I do want to comment on a, a, an issue of some interest today in particular, but let me just give you a little bit of context. Uh, prior to the transition to Iraqi sovereignty in the middle of last year, in, in early 2004, we dispatched, the department dispatched an assessment team uh, led by Army Major General Carl Eikenberry uh, to evaluate the extant direction of Iraqi security force training operations uh, as it existed again at the time. Uh, it was a useful thing to have done. It was one of about five or six assessment teams that we sent during that period as the transition to Iraqi sovereignty loomed. Um, working closely with coalition commanders and with uh, Iraqi leaders, civilian and military, General Eikenberry made several recommendations that helped put the development of Iraqi security forces on their present path. Um, commander of the Central Command, the commander of multinational corps in Iraq, the chairman, the secretary have agreed over the period, several past several weeks, that it, it would be useful to provide another assessment. Uh, and General Gary Luck, whom I think some of you may know, uh, served as the embedded senior mentor to General Franks and General Abizade during the development of uh, what became known as Op Operation Iraqi Freedom, uh, has agreed to lead the assessment team. Um, General Luck has been very involved in the last year or more, uh, a couple of years, uh, with uh, lessons learned that are being done by the Joint Forces Command of, of Iraqi Freedom and of the war plan and of subsequent uh, uh, security force development, et cetera. There's been a number of lessons learned tapped off of that effort. We briefed, I think, some of those things. General Luck's been involved in that. Uh, he's been, I'm told, to Iraq probably uh, four or five times uh, since the major combat phase. Uh, he was recently there at General Casey's request to uh, take a look at the way that the multinational corps headquarters are organized. He's just a wealth of knowledge uh, and has been used in a variety of mentoring capacities for a lot of senior general officers uh, and has agreed to develop an assessment team to go look at Iraqi security force development, take a look at where we are at the moment, uh, make recommendations, give General Casey and the others responsible for this an assessment of how they might uh, continue to accelerate uh, the, the, uh, the integration of Iraqi security forces into the Iraqi uh, structure over there. So it's, uh, it's something that's important. It's something that uh, we, we try and provide these kinds of assessments over time, and this is another one of those assessments. Um, and I suspect we'll have a few questions on it, an opportunity to discuss a little bit. And with that, I'll ask maybe General Rodriguez to give a, some discussion about some other points. Okay. Hey, thank you, Mr. Dorita, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, security for the 18 provinces in Iraq with the ballot distribution and polling sites remains a priority. Multinational forces and Iraqi security forces will continue offensive operations to ensure the conditions are set to support a safe and secure environment for the upcoming 30 January elections. Operation Unified Assistance is ongoing in Southeast Asia, as you all know. Uh, we're working closely with local officials 
UN personnel, and over a dozen other countries and agencies who are assisting with the relief efforts. More than 13,000 U.S. military personnel have distributed over 365 tons of supplies. Air crews have flown more than 450 rescue, recovery, and supply missions, and almost 900 hours of flight time to bring aid to the people of the affected areas. And with that, we'll take your questions. Mr. Olinger. Larry, uh, I'm led to believe, speaking to some other people in this building, that, that Gary Luck's portfolio will be much broader, that, that while it will be the major thing, perhaps be uh, an assessment of, of Iraqi training and integration, that he will have a much broader portfolio looking into the overall policy, military policy and mm -hmm. situation in Iraq. Is that not true, or is that the That's only not thing true. I mean, it's just not accurate. He, so he's, the only thing he's going to look at is military. His, is his mission is to go over there and take a look at Iraqi security force development. Where, where are we? How's it going? Uh, provide an assessment to the commanders over there. Uh, and um, as I said, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's, he's, one, he's, a, he's a source that General Casey and others, General Abizaid, have tapped from time to time. Uh, he's uh, a, an extraordinarily intelligent individual and a very uh, uh, studious individual. He, he knows an awful lot about what we're doing in Iraq. So, but but his, his mission and his objective is to provide some assessment of where we, how we're doing with the security forces. And that's the only thing he'll do? That's his mission. Is he a civilian equivalent or a civilian uh, counterpart? To, uh, uh, I don't know the full composition of the team. It's, uh, he's a civilian. Obviously, he's a retired oh, general. Yeah. Uh, but it's this is primarily security force expertise that we're looking for. That kind of you know, it's it, it it's more than training and equipping because, you know, there's security forces how how they're organized and how they're being used and how they interact with uh, other segments of Iraqi. You know, there's police officers and but it's 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 security forces writ large. Larry, is there concern about how things are going with the security forces? Is this something the commanders asked for? The prior assessment by Mr. Eikenberry was done at a time when I think most people acknowledged that things weren't going well with the Iraqi security forces. Is this an indication you're concerned about it? I, I would describe it the way I did, which is the, the Iraqi security forces are getting more and more involved in the security of Iraq. Uh, and there's some areas uh, where they've just performed uh, very impressively. And uh, there's a desire to keep, to stay on track and see that they continue to perform to their utmost potential. And any ability that we have to help the folks, the tr to help the trainers take a look and assess is, uh, we all think, is a good thing to do. You're always... Uh, when you're assessing something continuously, it's difficult to determine if you're assessing it because you're concerned or you're assessing it because you want to continue to improve. I, I wouldn't characterize it beyond the way I did. Uh, so, it's a I, I continual mean, assessment, and this, this will help uh, provide some expertise that um, uh, is not involved in day-to-day -day concerns about contracting and do we have the right equipment. They can come in with a, with a look that's... Um, a little more detached, and that's always helpful. But, but Larry, you, you painted a pretty bright picture there, and things. I painted well. a bright picture. I, I mean, I'm painting a are, picture, yes, and you can yes, describe sure. it. Okay, I would describe what you just said as a pretty bright picture, and you didn't express any real concerns. Are you saying there aren't any real concerns about uh, about the Iraqi security forces? I, I wouldn't feel competent to discuss it beyond the way our own commanders have discussed it, and they've discussed it in the terms that I've just provided you, which is in, in many areas. General Metz this week talked about uh, uh, some impressive operations that have been conducted by the Iraqi security forces. Uh, there's, there's always, in, this is a new enterprise for Iraq, and so there's, uh, there's an interest in seeing a, a mid-grade officer corps develop, uh, and that's something that uh, a lot of people are spending time trying to make sure we're doing all we can to help that along. Uh, there's areas where they've where the Iraqi security forces have performed well. There's areas where they've performed suboptimal, you know, not as well. There's areas where they've uh, been overwhelmed by their opposition and, and have had to uh, step back and live the fight another day. And there's areas where they've just plain not participated in the fight. But the the general trend is in the right direction toward a lot better uh, integration with the coalition and a lot better, a lot, a greater and rising uh, percentage of the security responsibility of Iraq. I mean, the trends are in the proper direction. It's a question of acceleration and how well can we get it done and quickly. And I'm sorry, did General Casey and General Abizaid ask for this or was this something the Secretary wanted? The, it's very difficult to, to, to parse how decisions like this are made. 
I guess I'd say that if it, if it turns out that everybody is happy with the way this goes, there'll be a thousand people claiming credit for it. And if it turns out that it's, it's less useful than others wished it might be, they'll all blame Rumsfeld. But it's something that uh, has, it, you know, th they talk several times a day, multiple times a week, uh, and they've been talking about uh, evaluating where we think we are with, the, with Iraqi security forces for probably six or eight weeks. So, and, and I, I, it would be hard for me to describe, you know, how an idea germinates around here. But so I know General that if it's, if it's popular, a lot, there'll be a lot of people claiming General credit Rodriguez. for it. Um, question about um, the election. President Bush has said that there won't be a delay in the election. And, and General Metz said yesterday that, that if the election were held today for the provinces, you, know, you could not hold an election. And I'm wondering, can you tell us, without revealing, you know, operational details about the future operations, I mean, what is the plan over the next 23 days to get those four provinces in shape for an election? No, I, I think uh, General Metz talked about that with uh, the, they're putting uh, emphasis on those areas with the offensive operations to uh, decrease the effectiveness of the insurgency to negatively impact the election. And uh, that's, that's where their focus of effort is, and uh, that's what they're going to do between now and the election. I mean, uh, so, by the way, so, let me just, if I can just interrupt for a second. Uh, it's not clear to me that General Metz said what you said he said, that if the elections were held today, they couldn't be holding. He acknowledged that there's some areas where it's going to be more difficult than others. I, but I'd be very careful. Maybe he said that. I just don't think he did. I mean, I thought he said that, that, that four of the provinces weren't ready to, to have an election. My, my question was just, is it, is it just a military I mean, effort? You said that there's going to be military operations. I mean. What I talked about was just the military yeah. effort. The uh, Iraqi, you know, uh, election commission is doing all kinds of things to uh, assist with that too. But uh, I talked about the military part of it only. Uh, you're confident that that by the 30th, the, the military efforts combined with the other efforts will, will right. Get that's the goal, and that's the intent. And that's here's what, what General is. Metz said. Just to be very clear, he was asked a question. You said that 14 of 18 provinces are prepared and secured to hold elections. Is the corollary to that that four are not prepared and secured? His answer. Well, Al Anbar, Nineveh, parts of Baghdad, and I think the Salahadin is the next as you would rank them. Those are four areas that we see enough of the attacks, and we're going to continue to focus our energies and effort. I mean, I, so I just characterize it by using what he said. And there's four areas where there's more violence going on than, than uh, we wish was going on, but there's going to be elections in Iraq, and they're going to be held on, on January 30th, and this is uh, as the result of the transition administrative law, the UN Security Council resolutions, and the will of the Iraqi people. And General Corelli talked about polls that indicate 70 to 80 percent, and these are Iraqi polls, of the people in Iraq won elections. So, General Rodriguez, how would you characterize the current capability of the Iraqi military? The, uh, I'm not going to characterize that. I think the commanders have done a good job on that m on multiple uh, occasions, and I uh, think what Larry said is what uh, anybody would say is uh, obviously they've done well in certain areas, and other areas uh, they have not done as well as we wanted. So, uh, and that's why part of the you know assessment is going over to uh, to check that. Can out. Can you give us any idea of whether you're on track uh, purely in in terms of the numbers of trained military and uh, security personnel that you expected to have at this time? Setting aside for a moment how right as far as the are. train and uh, equipped personnel, yeah, we're about on track. That's do you have right. any idea, do you know what those numbers are? Metz gave some numbers. Yes, I think he said there's 60 battalions that are operational at the moment, and he had some metrics for how far, how many more they wanted. Uh, we can provide what we think our timeline is. I think we've done that along the way, and we'll, we'll see if there's enough. Any of those uh, battalions are uh, equivalent at all in capability to a to a U.S. unit? Are they, have any Iraqi forces? achieve the level of uh, training and capability that would make them on the par with uh, American military forces? Well, the... Uh, well, let me, let me t then General, I mean, you're free to try it. There is probably no battalions in the world that are on par with the U.S. battalions. So that's the wrong comparison. Are they on par with their opponents inside of Iraq? Increasingly, yes. And increasingly, they're becoming very capable. Are they on par with other uh, security forces in the region? They're going to be there. But to, to compare them to the United States of America, there, there is, again, there's probably no battalions in the world that are on, on par with the United States of America. It's an unfair metric. Do you have anything like that? Nor is that the goal, to make them, you know, it's uh, proficient yeah, and right. equipped and fully modernized as American battalions. Well, are any of them, uh, have any of them met 100 percent of their objectives in terms of what your goals are for their performance? Yes, there have been uh, 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 several of them that have done that. And, uh, f well, for one of the examples that uh, 
many people have understood and watched and seen multiple times, been the 36th uh, National Guard Battalion. It's done a tremendous job in multiple operations in different places, both in conjunction with uh, U.S. and coalition forces and on their own. And it's, it, believe me, the mentoring that the U.S. is doing with them will get them more up to speed, and that's important, and there needs to be more of that. And, you know, the assessment that uh, General Luck can provide can perhaps offer some additional insights into how we can achieve the objective I think you're trying to dis uh, get to, which is, you know, good enough for the region, good enough for their potential adversaries, and good enough for security inside of Iraq. I mean, that's, that's got to be how we measure it. Carl. Larry, to what extent are there discussions going on in this building about extending the tour of uh, Army Reserves and National Guard beyond 24 months? And can you give us any light on that? Uh, what, the, what, what there's a lot of discussion about is how do we uh, accelerate the transformation of the United States Army into a force that is needed for this century? Uh, and that, can, that involves a wide range of notions. Uh, at the core of that is the redesign of the Army's combat power uh, through what the Army describes as modularity, but what it really means is, is more rapidly deployable, agile, flexible, and powerful uh, units that are more capable at lower levels than the current division structure permits. Uh, and th the uh, Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of the Army are, are embarked on a very ambitious uh, plan to transform the Army by developing uh, a, a, about a 30 percent increase in the capability, the combat capability of the deployable units in, in uh, the Army with, by using the temporary headroom provided for by the emergency authorities that we have, that the Congress has provided. Uh, that's, that's, that's really the focus of Army transformation. Along with that, there's a lot of work going on to rebalancing the skills that we need out of the reserves and into the active force. That's taking time, but uh, there's, there's an enormous amount of energy behind it and there's progress being made. Uh, in addition to that, there's a lot of conversion of currently military uh, units or military billets into civilian. We've probably converted or have scheduled to convert tens of thousands of billets for, that are currently held by military people using new authorities that the Congress has provided to make it uh, easier to put civilians in those billets. While all that's happening, there's going to be transition um, needs uh, that might result in the temporary, uh, for example, the, the temporary uh, additional unit of forces that we have in the Army right now. I mean, we are above end strength because the authority permits, permits that. Uh, the Army is currently assessing all of the other options that can be done temporarily. Uh, so there's thinking going on. And when there's thinking, there's a lot of... Uh, leaking and when there's leaking there's a lot of breathless reporting but there's the, the army is looking at a, a wide range but there are no proposals recommendations that have been presented to do that what you described to make permanent any of the things that are temporary right now uh, they're, they're just we've got a, a range of initiatives going on to analyze the stress on the force and what can be done but at the core of it and you're gonna see it I think reflected when um, when the president submits the budget for this department, uh, we have recommended, the department has recommended uh, a lot of focus on Army transformation, and I think we'll see some of that uh, in, in the coming year or two in terms of resources being applied to that problem. Money. Is increasing the 24 months, is increasing the 24 months among the items that are being discussed, illuminated, bandied about? There's, there's no specific recommendation on that. So, I, I mean, I would just refer... Is that being discussed? You said a whole number of things being discussed. Is that one of the issues being discussed? There, Possibly I'm, expanding the I, the I I am unaware of all of the things the Army is looking at to, that would ultimately become proposals. So, I, I, there's no proposals to do that that I'm aware of. How would General Luck's analysis of what he finds going to play into that? <laughs> Will, will this be it's not related to it? Not related not to really it at all. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay, Mr. Delita, do you think with uh, sending General Gary Luck to Iraq, the DOD is looking to draw or to put a new military strategy on the ground, especially that the political strategy after the election uh, would uh, would be changed, would be different? I believe I've answered that. It, it's it, General Luck's mission is what I described. And, and I just don't need to expand on that. A follow-up to the modularity question. Um, 
there was a budget decision made that modularity was actually the benefactor of by about $25 billion, and accompanied with that was a $30 billion cut to various weapons programs that will likely show up in the budget that's coming out soon. Can you give us some context to that? Can you tell us whether that was a reflection of some sort of very constructive budget environment, or was this an already planned transformation move? Uh, there's a lot of things in your question that are uh, I, I, I can't comment on because they're specific numbers that we're not prepared to discuss. Uh, to discuss general cuts? I, I don't think anybody, when they see our budget, will discuss it in terms of cuts because this budget, our defense spending in this country has gone up 40 percent in the last three years. I'll get to it. already discussed cuts. I'll get to it. Uh, the defense spending in this, in this department has gone up something on the order of 35 or 40 percent since 2001. I expect, although these decisions aren't final, that there will be an increase in the defense spending this year as well. In other words, the fiscal year 2006 budget will be more than the fiscal year 2005 budget, and I'm laying aside supplementals and everything else. Uh, I know that the definition of a cut in Washington is when you don't spend as much as you wish you could spend. But, but a, a cut the way the rest of the world thinks about it is you're spending less than you were spending yesterday or in the previous period. That's not likely to happen in our budget. Again, without discussing details and specifics, I think what you'll see in this budget is, is uh, continued commitment to transforming this department into the kind of 21st century network-centric, agile, lethal, based on precision, based on uh, uh, a transformed, accelerated transformation of the Army into the, the kind of Army I described earlier. And, and, and then when the budget comes out, we can all look at the numbers and decide whether it's closer to the way I described it or closer to the way you described it. But numbers aside, are you saying then that the leading up to the, the, the budget submission to Congress, the transformation was the number one issue, or was there any sort of issue of constrained Transformation changes? is the number one issue in the development of this budget. There's no question about it. Changes in the press are reflective of a transformation agenda. Excuse me? The, ch the changes reflected in the press, then, are, are a reflection of a transformation agenda? I, I don't know what press articles you're referring to. Maybe one you wrote? I maybe didn't see I it. But <laughs> when, when the budget comes actually. out, we'll be happy to discuss it in great detail, and then people can draw their own conclusions. The budget that, I, that, that we've recommended and that I think has received general support and has been generally in the broadest brushstrokes uh, outlined to some of the uh, some members of Congress is what I described, a, a, a continued commitment to transformationist department, a continued uh, an acceleration of Army transformation, uh, an acceleration of, of, of a host of other important uh, both technological and organizational um, initiatives. And once all the numbers are available, we can all parse them and look all at right, them. Did uh, Secretary Rumsfeld read uh, General Helmley's memo? I don't know. What's the reaction been to that memo? Again, there's a lot of thinking going on. That was an internal document that reflected the musings of one officer to another officer on an important topic. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate that it leaked, and it's unfortunate that uh, people have drawn conclusions as though thinking uh, equals decisions. But I mean, that, I, I, don't, I don't have a specific comment on his reaction to the memo because I don't Calling know that he read it. The reserves of degenerating into a broken force. Specific. I don't know. I mean, the reserves are performing magnificently. Uh, they're and they're uh, they're doing an enormous amount of important work around the world. Uh, I think people who are in the reserves feel very good about what they're doing. We're meeting our retention goals for the most part across the board in reserves. I don't know if you have anything. You want to very good. Right over here. We'll um, there's been a lot of discussion recently of the efforts to improve the armor protection of vehicles for the uh, U.S. military in Iraq to adapt to the insurgency uh, tactics there. Um, yesterday, the insurgents carried out a devastating attack on a Bradley fighting vehicle, one of the most heavily armored uh, in the U.S. infantry. Is that not symbolic of the fact that the insurgency continues to be able to adapt its tactics more quickly than the U.S. military does? Well, the, uh, the attack on the uh, Bradley, we've uh, noticed in the recent uh, couple of weeks that the uh, IEDs are all being built more powerfully uh, to, uh, uh, with uh, more, uh, more explosive effort and a smaller number of IEDs, and uh, that uh, trend has uh, occurred over the last uh, you know, two weeks here. Uh, but uh, again, uh, the IED challenge is uh, not purely going to be met with 
armored vehicles uh, because uh, I think I explained before we've uh, uh, lost a, uh, a tank, the most heavily armored vehicle in the world, and uh, and uh, Br uh, Bradley like uh, just the, the other day that you discussed. But uh, the response and the the way we're going to uh, overcome that is a, is a multi-pronged effort on uh, tactics, techniques, procedures, intelligence, and uh, a wide range of things to prevent that from uh, from hurting our soldiers. But, but I mean, if I can add a little bit to that, I would refer you back to what I believe it was General Metz and Corelli both talked about with the IED threat. General uh, Corelli believes for every IED go that goes off, he's, he's finding one. So he thinks he's about one for one in terms of what's out there. But you don't know the universe what's out there, but he, he feels like he's increasing, again, to the point that General Rodriguez made, the, the going after finding these things as opposed to trying to protect perfectly uh, is one of the imp priorities, and General Corelli believes he's making progress in that regard. General Metz believes, and he talked about it in his press conference, that the sophistication of these things has actually decreased. Uh, he's got, and he describes some indicators as to why he believes that. So it's difficult to assess the trend on this particular threat, but it's one that we're going after aggressively through many, many of. Uh, 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 directions as General Rodriguez described. General Rodriguez, can I follow up though? You said you're noticing something. You, you mentioned the last two weeks. If I understood you correctly, IEDs being built more powerfully but smaller. Are you seeing? A lower number of IEDs, but they've been more powerful. So, uh, for Are example. Are you seeing a different type of explosive? Are you seeing a no, different it's, design? It's you, uh, more explosives in the, the IEDs. Do you? So, uh, a larger IED instead of the high number of IEDs. There have been less number and larger in size and explosive power. Does this lead you to believe um, there, is it just simply a change or do you think there are essentially uh, new uh, bomb makers, new designers that have entered Iraq? Because in the past you have noticed the emergence of new designs and you've speculated that there have been new people making mm -hmm. them. What do you think is going on here? Uh, I think it's too early to tell at this point right now. but. Uh, uh, we'll continue to watch that carefully like uh, they have been in uh, both uh, the efforts that uh, uh, General Corelli mentioned that seem to be making some po positive impact on the challenge. And can I just also follow up these new types of IEDs you're seeing location-wise? Are they across the country? Are they mainly in Baghdad? Are they in the Sunni Triangle? Where are you seeing them? It's, uh, it's been mainly in the Sunni Triangle. General, to follow up on that, I mean, can you give us any sense of what they're using? Is it trapping through artillery shells together? Is it you know, plastic explosives, I mean, the sophistication. It's been a combination of everything. The, the point that I was trying to make was just the explosive power of them has seemed to increase in the last couple of weeks. But, but I would say, again, I would caution you to go back to Metz's characterization, which right. is that they've gone, his impression is they're less sophisticated, more spectacular. I think is a fair characterization of how he described it. Good combination. Right. What's that? It's not a good combination. I'm just describing it. I'm not trying to characterize it. That's what he's Can I ask another question on a different subject? I mean, he gave some examples, and I wouldn't want to try and repeat them. You can go back and read the transcript. And the budget, I have to push back a little bit here. You're saying this year's the 06 budget will be greater than. Uh, I'm saying no decisions have been made. I think people will be able to evaluate it when the numbers come out. PBD describes cuts after 08 of 30 billion. 06 and 07 are largely neutral. So. We'll talk numbers when the budget comes out. Right, well, I just want to clarify that because you're, you're I told you what I told you. Has we'll OMB numbers. approved that PBD's numbers? We'll talk numbers when the budget comes out. Well, I'm not asking numbers, but just general you just said Your question ended in the word numbers, question mark. I didn't say the number. <laughs> New topic. <laughs> Can I go back maybe, to the Maybe we got time for one or two more. Back to the elections. Is the current thinking that offensive operations between now and January 30th will allow elections to take place in all 18 provinces? Uh, I think... Uh, what, uh, when General Metz talked about that, that was exactly what uh, he was talking about, that we're going to make focus all our energy and efforts on, the, on the, trying to get the elections to be as best as it possibly can be secured for the 30 January elections. And he's focusing on those four areas that he talked about. I'll give you another question. Okay, talking about the budget, is there any... Ah, okay. Yeah, my last question. Numbers. I didn't, you didn't do very well on your okay. previous one. Is there any link between the increasing of the budget uh, for the army of $25 billion and the consequences of uh, the war in Iraq? The, uh, first of all, I'm not talking numbers. I think I made that clear. <laughs> you used a number which I'm not going to uh, acknowledge. Uh, the army is going through a transformation. It is everybody's desire that that transformation proceed as, as rapidly as it's possible. 
Uh, and you'll see, I, I believe that our budget will reflect that. The war in Iraq up until now for a variety of decisions that have been made between the Congress and the executive branch has been principally funded through supplemental appropriations. So it's, a, it's a, in a sense a separate matter. Uh, Last question, right. ma'am. No, this is not a number of Two more. New subject. Okay. New subject. Uh, subject and special, questioner. Specialist Grainer uh, went on trial this morning. His lawyer says uh, not only whatever he did, uh, he was following orders, but that he questioned some of the orders and he was told by senior commanders, this is legal and go ahead and do it. Uh, can you say for sure that that didn't happen? Well, I can't comment on the specifics of a criminal trial, and that's what he's ongoing is a criminal trial. There was no policy of, uh, there was no policy, and none of the um, investigations that have been uh, concluded to date have, have been able to draw a connection between the activity at Abu Ghraib, in particular the activity that Special, Specialist Grainer was uh, alleged to have participated in, and uh, any approved policies of this department. And I'll leave it at that. Could, uh, uh, Wolf we could both Wolf 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 Can you yeah, shed any light on his future? Uh, he's doing a terrific job. Uh, he's he's uh, He's got a, a man of enormous capability, and he's serving as the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Has the Secretary asked him to stay, and has he agreed to stay? Um, I, I can't comment on, I mean, I just don't know the nature of the individual. I think Paul's intention is to stay. He's serving uh, in, the, in the job. I think it's, it's a job that the Secretary would be very happy if he did stay in it. Uh, he's performing magnificently and is, is value-added in everything he's involved in. Definite than he, do you think he's going to stay? I don't. I just, I, I'll stick with what I said. He's, he's, he's doing great, and he's in the job, and as far as, I'm con as far as I understand, he intends to stay in the job, and the Secretary would be very happy if he did. Is there any reason he wouldn't stay? <laughs> could you, uh, General, could you set our expectations for this election and security? Um, I, I can anticipate a situation where things could go pretty well in 15 or 14 provinces and there could be some spectacular car bombs in some others. What are you guys looking at to say, all in all, practically, this is, this is a good result or, or this is you know, much worse than what we had expected? What would be a what would be a reasonably good result given the realities on the ground there? Uh, you know, clearly the Iraqi people are going to be the ones who determine the success of the election and the legit legitimacy of uh, how, that, uh, how that goes, and uh, that's what we're trying to support the interim Iraqi government in accomplishing so that they have a free and fair election as best as it possibly can happen. Right, but you guys are, are, have the, the responsibility security, for security. So. That's correct. And so what is a, an outcome on the ground that you think, okay, that will be pretty good? Like, You've got to be coming up with some best case and worst case scenarios. We want as many people as want to vote be able to get to the polling stations and, and, and cast their vote. That's what the goal is. That's what we continue to focus on, and we'll continue to uh, take the operations required to get there. Okay, but reality of, of satellite television and the way things are, and you guys are going to complain about this the day after. If there are cameras at well, one we'll car We'll complain about it now, then. Give us a crack. <laughs> if, there's, if there's a car bomb and there are cameras there, the world is going to look at this election. There's going to be a lot of hand wringing about it. It shouldn't have gone on. <coughs> the security was too bad, or you know, this whole thing was a disaster. What is the metric you guys are going to be using at that point to say, you know what, there was one car bomb, but that's okay because we were afraid of 50, or if there are 10, that's yes. within the bounds of what we were expecting, and yeah. we will have considered that a success. I don't think there's any metrics established that, that uh, I give, know of at this It was point. your example, not mine. That's the way it happened in Afghanistan. And the contemporaneous reporting of the elections was, this is really bad. There's all kinds of challenges and conflicts. And about six weeks later, they inaugurated a president. So, we'll, you know, there will be a national assembly that comes out of this election. And that's a great thing, and that's the metric. There will be an election, and there will be a national assembly. Last question. Uh, one of the early goals uh, from commanders on the ground was that the elections be held without U U.S. troops in U.S. uniforms standing outside the polling sites and that it be handled almost entirely by the Iraqi security forces. Is that possible given the, the state of affairs now? I, uh, General Mess discussed that the other day. He said that is the plan. They continue to coordinate that plan with the uh, interim Iraqi government as well as the Iraqi security forces, that uh, those are, are the people that are closest to the polling stations. And the United States is there to support uh, the United States and coalition forces are there to support them as required. Thanks a lot, folks. Thank Have you. a great weekend.